Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you that we can come to you and worship you in praise and adoration. We humble ourselves to you. You are the great I am. You are such a great God, and you are a loving God that gave his son for us that we might have everlasting life. So Father, I thank you that we have this time to open up your word, to learn the truths that your word shares, us, shares with us, that we have life and life more abundantly through your son. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit as I preach and I teach the words that you've given me in the name of Jesus and fill this room with every single person with the Holy Spirit to go out and boldly preach the name and, and not hold back from preaching the name of Jesus as we see in this book of Acts. So in the name of Jesus, we ask this and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, good. Well, we're continuing our study in the book of Acts here. And uh, if you have your Bibles, open up with me to chapter four of the book of Acts. And we're, we're working our way through this chapter. And we see that in chapter four, Peter and John are standing trial for teaching and proclaiming the truth. They're actually standing in front of the Sanhedrin council being condemned for preaching Jesus' name, for saying Jesus' name, and they're being persecuted for the sake of the name of Jesus. And, and so remember, all this started back whenever Peter and John were entering the temple in chapter 3. And they were going to the hour of prayer, and they were being led of the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit told Peter and John to heal the man that was lame from his mother's womb sitting at the temple gate. And, and so Peter uh, reached down his hand and said in verse 6, remember uh, chapter 3, verse 6, he says, silver and gold I, I don't have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so at that moment, the Holy Spirit, through, you know, through Peter, as an ambassador for Jesus Christ, that man was healed and made perfectly whole. And he, he rose up leaping and walking and praising God because of the miracle that had happened. And so this miraculous healing then causes a stir, right? Everybody then comes running over into Solomon's porch and they see that this amazing miracle just happened because this man who'd been lame from his mother's womb after 40 years has now been, is, you know, has been healed. He's leaping and praising God. And so everybody comes running over to to see how can this man be healed? What's actually going on? Who healed this man? And so uh, immediately, Peter and John start giving all the praise to Jesus Christ, and Peter starts preaching a sermon. And we see that in, in verse four of chapter four, that there are two responses to preaching the name of Jesus. And actually, there's two responses to the sign that, that went before preaching the name of Jesus. Because remember, the sign, the miracle, exposes their heart, and then the the word of God preached, then it, it, it exposes those two, two things that we see that in verse four, that there were those who heard the word and believed. You look at verse four of chapter four. However, many of those who heard the word believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So many thousands of people heard the word and believed and came into the kingdom of God. But we also see that there was, uh, there was another response. There was a response of those who had a hard heart that didn't receive the word of God. In fact, they rejected the name of Jesus and they, um, and, and they actually arrested Peter and John. We see that in verses one through three. They actually came up and they were greatly disturbed and they laid their hands on, they threw their hands on Peter and John and threw them in jail. So you can see that there's actually two responses to the word of God and the preaching in the name of Jesus. There's those that humble their heart and there are those that harden their heart. And so that's two responses that we as Christians need to expect. Sometimes they receive the word in gladness and praise God, you got a brother and you can rejoice in that. But then other times there's persecution that comes because of preaching the name of Jesus. And we see both responses here and we're seeing now that Peter and John are actually in prison because they have preached in the name of Jesus. So after being arrested, they were thrown in jail for the night. The, um, the Sadducees and the chief priests, they gather together the Sanhedrin council for the next day, and Peter and John are now standing trial before the Sanhedrin council. And we can learn so much from this trial, from them standing in front of the Sanhedrin council on how do we respond to persecution? And we talked about that last week, is what's the response to persecution? And it's standing bold in truth. And that's what we're gonna continue seeing as Peter and John are standing in front of the Sanhedrin council. And so notice that they didn't respond with violence. 
right? Whenever they got arrested, they didn't retaliate. They didn't respond in violence. Uh, you know, you, you see a lot of how Peter changed. Remember whenever they arrested Jesus and Peter actually cut the guy's ear off, yeah. right? Now you look at what's happening. They get arrested and he's just going with it. He's trusting God. And so he is being led of the spirit. And, and remember what we said last week too, this is a divine appointment that God has placed in them in front of the Sanhedrin council. I mean, there's 71 rulers of Israel here. How, what's the, another chance that Peter and John are going to be able to preach the gospel to these elite people of, of Jerusalem. So, so he's trusting God. And the other thing that they didn't do is they didn't compromise the gospel, right? So that was what they do. Whenever you preach the name of Jesus, there's going to be a persecution that comes with that but you don't compromise the gospel. You don't compromise the truth. No matter how much they're coming against you, no matter how much they're, they're uh, ridiculing you and mocking you and, and even torturing you and hurting you, you never compromise the gospel. And we're gonna see much more of that as we go through the rest of this chapter here today. And so the thing that they did, instead of compromising and, and not retaliating, they stood faithfully in truth, proclaiming the name of Jesus, and they preached the exclusivity of his name. They preach that Jesus Christ is the only way, that there's no other name by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. That's what they preach. And they, they, didn't, they didn't waver from that. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, right? That's what we preach. And that's why they hate us, because we preach the gospel and the exclusivity of his name. And so that's where we left off in verse 12 of chapter four. Now we're gonna continue, and today we're gonna get through verses 13 through 26. And so I want to go ahead and read those to start, but to get the full context, I just want to carry it on through to verse 31 um, because I can't cram in all, all to verse 31 and I don't want to even try. There's some really amazing things that happen uh, up to verse 31, but to get context, I want us to read the whole thing and then we're going to see not only how did Peter and John respond to the persecution, but then also what did they do afterward with their fellow brethren in fellowship? And so that's that's what we want to look at. So open up your Bibles to chapter four. We're going to read from verse 13 down to 31. So he says, now when they, they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Praise God. I love that verse. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them to speak to all, who, uh, to all, commanded them not to speak to all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they heard, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went down to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests had, and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. You made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servants servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their, on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness, they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus and when they had prayed the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness 
Man, praise God, that is, that is such a powerful ending to persecution. Notice how they end with boldness. They end with boldness speaking to the Sanhedrin, and they end with boldness in their prayer among their fellow believers. And so Peter and John, that's what they're doing here. They're, they're speaking with boldness. They're speaking the word of God with boldness in front of the Sanhedrin. And so whenever they go back and they tell their fellow brethren, this is what happened, then the, the prayers of the brethren is, let us stand bold together like Peter and John, filled with the Holy Spirit, and may, con- may signs and wonders continue just as we saw with that healed lame man, right? So what, a, what an amazing story that this gut leads into. And notice that Peter is doing this. He's, he, Peter and John are both together, and they're, they're preaching the word with boldness, but that boldness doesn't come from them. Yes, Peter was a, a strong man. John was a strong man. But that boldness came from the Spirit of God. They were, notice in verse eight, it says, then Peter, filled with this Holy Spirit, said to them. He's filled with the Spirit, speaking this boldness. And this boldness comes to those who spend their time with Jesus Christ. Because when you spend your time with Jesus Christ, he fills you with his Spirit, and you're an ambassador of him on Christ's behalf, and he gives you the Spirit to speak boldly in his name. And so that's that's how we start out verse 13 as we start going, verse by verse. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. That's the, that's the key right there. They realized that they had been with Jesus. And so the boldness came as a result of their complete trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And the Sanhedrin, they saw this and they couldn't understand it. They saw this boldness of, of you know, these fishermen from Galilee preaching the gospel and they, they were confused because of this boldness. The religious rulers were gazing at Peter. Look at this, um, this word saw. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter, that word saw in the Greek is actually not just that they saw it, but they're, they're actually gazing in amazement. The Sanhedrin council are, are looking at Peter and John in the boldness and they're gazing in amazement that of, what, of the words that they're hearing coming out of their mouth. They marveled, and look at this, they marveled. So they're gazing in amazement at the boldness. They're marveled because these are uneducated and untrained men that they're speaking to. And so this is now the fishermen from Galilee. They're, they're, these are men that, they grew up on a fishing boat. They didn't train in the rabbinical schools. They didn't train from the Pharisees. You know, how can these people be doing this? And they would never admit this, but I just, this is why I look at this. I think they're kind of jealous. I think they see that Peter and John are speaking the word of God boldly to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees, and they've spent their life studying the scriptures, and now who are these fishermen that are expounding the word of God better than we can? You know, they're actually, they're actually interpreting scripture better than the Pharisees, and so how could this actually be happening? And so then Luke tells us the, the reason. They realized that they had been with Jesus Christ. Man, that's so much. That's everything. Those who spend their time with Jesus Christ are growing into Christ-likeness. So they remember, these same Pharisees and Sadducees, are. they remember seeing Jesus speak with authority, right? They, they, They said that whenever Jesus would speak, they didn't hear anybody else that could speak like that. And they even said the same thing uh, that to Jesus as they did with Peter and John. You know, who does this man think he is? How, he didn't grow up in our schools, right? But those that, that spend their time with Jesus grow into Christ's likeness. This is what Jesus said in John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, right? But notice that, that connection. We have to abide in his word. You can't be set free, and you can't grow into Christ's likeness until you abide in his word and abide in his truth. That's who fo- those are the ones who follow Jesus Christ. And, we, and when we follow Jesus Christ in his word that he's given us, remember, he is the logos, and that logos has been, become scripture that we can read and hold and know that we have everlasting life in our hands when we read it. This is the word of God. And so when we abide in his word, we're abiding in him. And this is what the apostles were doing. If you just flip over to Acts chapter six, look at how these apostles continued in studying the scriptures. I mean, you just think about it. So they, they were Jews. They knew the Old Testament. 
But, they, but once they heard Jesus and they found Jesus in the scriptures, then all of a sudden the Old Testament had life. The scriptures had life to them because they found Jesus in them. So now they're spending their time continually studying the word of God, studying the Old Testament because they don't have the New Testament yet, right? It hasn't been written. So they're studying the ancient scriptures. They're studying their Hebrew text. And so they're, they're looking at that and they're finding Jesus in the scriptures. And notice what they say. By, by chapter six, there's actually thousands of people coming into the body of Christ and, and the apostles are trying to do their best they can to manage the situation, but then they realize that they're getting pulled away from the things of God and they're not, they're not holding up to their apostolic duties and instead they're finding themselves waiting on people. And so they appoint seven deacons and, and so we're gonna get to that in chapter six, but they appoint seven deacons and look at verse um, two. It says, then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Notice what they're doing. They, they, in order for them to serve the people, they gotta leave the word of God. And so they don't wanna do that, so they gotta, and they gotta you know, establish some type of order here so that way they can maintain their word, they maintain their time in the word of God. And then if you go on, it says, um, in verse three, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who may appoint Oh, who, who we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word of God, of the word. So that's what the apostles are doing. They're spending their time in the word of God. And so I would just encourage all of you, spend your time in the word of God. Read the Bible every day. This is where life is and find Jesus in, in these words. And your, your, your life, the joy of the Lord will come up and this is how you stand against persecution. When the world is telling you what's right and wrong, the only way you know what's right is if you know what the word says because they're going to lie to you and say what they're saying is right but you need to know what does the word of God say and that's what is right and so look at verse 14 now and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them they could say nothing against it so notice another thing that they're seeing they're seeing the boldness of Peter and John but they're also seeing this man who's healed from his mother's womb, that was lame from his mother's womb. So they're actually seeing all these things that are bewildering them. They're in amazement. They see, Pete, they see the boldness of Peter and John, and they see this man who has been perfectly healed. And what's the answer to all of those things? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the reason why they're standing bold. Jesus Christ is the reason why this man is standing completely healed. And so, of course, they don't want to admit that, and, but they can't deny it. That's the thing, is these things are happening and they can't deny it. So they're trying to um, cover this up as best they can, but they, they really can't because it's evident to all. And so the Sanhedrin, they're, they're so flustered that they decide to call a timeout. They're like, this is getting out of control. I don't know, we're seeing this healed man. We're seeing Peter and John preaching the gospel. Okay, hold on, get them out of here. We need to have a conversation. So, so they get Peter and John out of there and they have a private deliberation and that's in fi verses 15 through uh, 17. It says, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it but so that it spreads no further among the people let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name so that's their plan they the religious leaders are so mad they're so bewildered they're so confounded and worst of all they're hard-hearted I mean that's the thing here they 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 see this notable miracle I mean they they are admitting that there's a notable miracle and they know that it's Jesus Christ that did this but they're so hard-hearted that they they don't humble themselves and repent they, they could have had salvation right there, but they harden their heart and they reject Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and really, that, the root of that is, is their spiritual pride. It's their pride. The yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, like yeah. The law, if you did exactly what it was supposed to do, yeah. it brought up their sin. Sure. Yes, good point. Yeah. They just stayed there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
you know, move into Christ. Yes, right. Out of 71, right? Yeah. yeah. None, none of them right here. None of them. They're all coming together in, you know, in, in, um, in agreement to reject Jesus Christ. Yeah. Powerful thing. And they, so, so here, and these are the leaders of Jerusalem. So I like that, Gail, that the, the word of God actually brought that sin to manifestation. It exposed them. It exposed that sin. And they had a choice right there. Do they humble or do they, do they harden? Yeah. Yeah, Lynn. Were, were some of the yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that they were, I mean, they could have been, it's possible that, that Nicodemus was in the Sanhedrin and it's very possible because he was the teacher of teachers. And so, but he's not here right now. I guarantee you. I, I, I just, I, I don't think that he is there because remember he, he did something very bold. He brought Jesus down from the cross and, and he, he protected him. He did. And I, I just see in my heart that Nicodemus found Jesus right then. He, you know, and so I, I don't think he would be going along with this. Um, that's just my personal conjecture. And, and, and if he was in this, he would be standing up. And I don't think we see, we don't see any of that happening here. So I, I don't believe that, um, that Nicodemus is here, but it's true. He might've been a part of the Sanhedrin back before. And we know Gamaliel was part of the Sanhedrin. He takes a stand and he actually has some good advice in chapter five. Uh, we don't know if he actually ever did come over to Jesus Christ. He may have, um, but he's definitely part of the Sanhedrin here that is rejecting them and doing this. And so, uh, so they can see that Jesus is at work in all this and they're willfully rejecting the truth and, and, and they can't, but they're, they, they got this problem because they can't hide it. They can't deny that these miracles have happened because it says it's been evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. So they've got this big problem because everybody in Jerusalem knew that this was the lame man from birth and now he's healed. This word evident in the Greek is phaneros. It actually means to shine out, to, sh to shine abroad, to make manifest to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And they, they go ahead and say, we can't deny it. So they've got to come up with some other plan to try and stop the name of Jesus from spreading. And so that's what they come up with in verse 17. They say, let us severely threaten them, but that, so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this this name. Now the Greek is very emphatic here because whenever they say severely threaten, it actually is a pele, a pele sometha. And if you hear my words, a pele, he actually repeats that word twice. A pele, a pele sometha. A pele is the noun uh, to th of threat. It's a threat. And a pele sometha is to threaten. So what they're literally saying here is let us threaten them with threats. And so they translated it severely threatened, but they're threatening with threats. They're, they're very emphatic in this too. They're so mad that they want to threaten with threats. They, they don't know what else to do. So all they can do is threaten them. So this is now their plan. And so they call Peter and John back into the council. And this is what they say in verse 18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. So that they came up with that privately and now they're saying it to Peter and John here. And so they're forbidding the name of Jesus. They're forbidding the name of Jesus to be taught and preached and, and they're forbidding that, they, that anything be done on the basis of the name of Jesus. That's what the Greek is saying there. And the reason why they target the name is because the name is where the power is right? The name is where the power, the name is what healed this man because Peter is very bold saying it's the name of Jesus that healed this man. It's the name that's giving them boldness and they can, they can see it. They can clearly see it. And it's the name that gives everlasting life. So that's why they're forbidding the name. The enemy, even today, is still trying to stop the name of Jesus. Look at how many times they're trying to, I mean, these, I don't want to get off on this too much, but the, these progressive Christians they use the name of Christ and they blaspheme Christ because they say that Christ is in all of us. It's in all of creation. And we just have to call on our inner Christ to, uh, to, to have everlasting life. That's what progressive Christians are saying. They call themselves Christians because they are using the name of Christ. It's blasphemy and they're using our Lord's name in vain there. And so it is the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's the one who came in the flesh and died for us as propitiation and was risen again unto our everlasting life. That's the name that we serve. 
serve, right? That's the name that is above every name. And so they're trying to stop the spreading of that name. And I just think about over the years, over the thousands of years of how they've tried to, to do that. We've talked about it before. You, you're, you're witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness and you, you ask them, you know, do you believe in Jesus? And they'll admit that they believe in Jesus. But do, you, do they believe in Jesus the way I just said it? No, they don't. They don't believe that Jesus is God. And those are the things that you have to, you have to ask them because you can't just be satisfied with saying, do you believe in Jesus? No, do you believe in this name that this name stands for uh, that, that gives us everlasting life? So now going back to Acts chapter four, we see this decree from the Sanhedrin council and the Sanhedrin council is this Supreme court of the, of the Jewish law. This is, there's not, not a higher court in Judea. Um, and so we know being in America that if the Supreme court issues some decree and we disobey that decree, it's a disobedience at the tallest order because the Supreme court is, is the law, right? And so whatever they decree becomes law. And so the same thing here is happening happening. This is the Supreme Court in Jerusalem. And now they've just made it illegal to speak in the name of Jesus. So this decree becomes the basis for all the persecutions that we see in the book of Acts. Because when you go through the book of Acts, many, many of the the majority of the persecutions coming against Christians are from the Jew of the Jewish people. And it's this decree right here that actually is the basis for that persecution to be legal. We see some of the persecution happen from Gentiles, like in Ephesus and things like that, but the majority of the persecution comes from the, the Judean council, from Jewish, uh, from Jewish leaders. And so re- remember Saul, who later becomes the apostle Paul. Remember whenever he goes up to the road, he goes on the road to Damascus and he goes up to Damascus. And what did he have in his hand to give him the authority to go up to Damascus to persecute Christians? He had letters from the high priest giving him that authority to go up and persecute Christians. Those letters were actually coming from the basis of this decree right here from Acts chapter four. This all starts the the decree that it's illegal to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. And so this is what this decree begins that. Now, this is just another note, and this is just my conjecture, just looking at the the whole book of Acts and why was the book of Acts written? Remember on our first lesson, we talked about why is the book of Acts being written? Well, I believe that the book of Acts was written as trial documents for Paul's appeal to Caesar. And remember, he's writing to a specific person, to Theophilus. Theophilus is a Roman officer, and he's in charge of handling Paul's, uh, Paul's case here. And so Luke is writing this book of Acts as trial documents. And I just find it curious that Luke, throughout this whole book, he is constantly bringing this point up, that it's the Jews that are attacking Christianity, and they have no basis other than their pride and their greed of, to say that preaching in the name of Jesus is illegal. So that's just one of my conjectures to kind of go along with this is that, that, you know, the Jews have no basis. They, Peter and John did nothing wrong here. And yet they are making it illegal to speak in the name of Jesus. And so we see that Luke is really driving the point to Theophilus because it's only their pride and greed that they could make this decree and that they shouldn't be persecuting Christians. Right? So I think that's kind of a, uh, kind of a side note, but it's always fun to kind of step back and look, you know, why was this book even written in the beginning. And you can see, so it, what's an amazing thing? This is the word of God. And so we can see these spiritual truths inside that, that speak to us right now today. And then we can also see that these were, this was Paul's brother, Luke, writing these things to prove and make sure that, that the name of Jesus could actually be preached, right? It's just kind of fun seeing the culture of what's happening around this text. Okay, so going back to now the Sanhedrin Council, so they've now made it illegal to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. And so now Peter and John and all Christians at this time, they have a choice. And that choice is, do you obey God or do you obey man? That's the question that now Peter and John are faced with and all the brethren that they go back and talk to. Do we obey God or do we obey man? And so the Jewish government is forbidding anyone to speak in the name of Jesus and they're making it illegal. But what did Jesus tell the apostles before he left? He said, go out and preach to the whole world in my name. So the Jewish council is saying, don't preach in the name. 
And Jesus, God himself, is saying, preach in my name. So who are you going to obey? <laughs> That's what's going through Peter and John's mind, right? They're, they're here in the, the Supreme Court of Jewish law saying, don't do what Jesus, my God, has told me to do. So this, who are you going to obey? And look at what Peter, how Peter and John respond. But Peter and John answered, and I keep saying Peter and John, these are Peter's words, but it, Luke keeps saying, John's right there with him. Every time, it's, it's not like they were talking in sync, but they were, they, are, they were of the same mind, right? This is what they believe. Peter and John are standing bold together. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That's a bold statement coming from the Jewish council. The Sanhedrin council is now, they're now making it a decree to, to, that to speak in the name of Jesus is illegal. And look at how Peter and John respond. They say, if it's right to obey man more than God, you be the judge. I think this is an amazing, it's a brilliant way led of the spirit to respond to this because what it does, this response actually puts conviction right back on them. It, they, they say we're obeying God, but you are not. This is a bold statement, putting it right back on them. We're obeying and listening to God, but if you think it's right to listen to man more than God, then you be the judge. But as for us, we're, we're going to obey God. We cannot not speak the things that we have seen and heard. I mean, that's an amazing, amazing stance. They're not only defending themselves, but I love this. It's only the Holy Spirit that can do this. They're putting the conviction back on this Sanhedrin council. Again, this whole thing is convicting their heart. But again, they, they just, they reject it. They, they, don't, they don't repent from it. They reject it. So now, remember Paul, he tells us in the letter of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, he says that as time progresses, evil will grow worse and worse. And that was right after he said, for uh, 2 Timothy 3.12, that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And then he says, by the way, as time progresses, evil will grow worse and worse. So be ready. This is what he's telling his son in the faith, Timothy. So that's what we need as Christians in the world. We're faced with this same, these same questions. As they come up, we're faced with these same questions. Do we obey God or do we obey man? And so this is a pretty relative thing because we just had that in our world in America today. We just had a taste of that from our own government. Our own government just recently told us it was illegal to gather together as the body of Christ and worship our Lord and Savior. They just told us that we can't do what we were commanded to do, that we were to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, right? They just, the government told us to do that. So we, this is a very sensitive issue because, and that's just the beginning. For the, for the government to sell us, you can't gather together. That's just a little taste of what we are going to see. It is progressing as evil grows worse and worse. They are trying to find ways, just like the Sanhedrin was doing, they're trying to find ways to, to not let the name of Jesus spread. That's what the enemy is doing. And so we have to stand for the truth. This is what we talked about last week, and it goes into this week as well. As these threats come, go on, and because they're not going to stop, they're going to continue to increase until they are persecuting us physically in the name of Jesus. These things are going to progress more and more, but with God, the answer is easy. With God, the answer, the, the, the answer to the question, do we believe, do we obey God or man? The answer is easy when you trust God, and it's we always obey God, and we obey the righteousness that comes from his word. And this is what I said at the beginning. The only way you know what his righteousness is is if you read the Bible, because these people are, they are so self-righteous, they think what they are telling you is actually righteousness. They think that it's love. They think it's all these things, but no, we go to the Bible, and the Bible tells us what's righteous and truth and love, and we say, Okay, we compare that to what the government's telling us and we, can, we have a decision. Do we obey God or do we, we obey man? And that's what we have to do every single day. Now look at what um, Peter says here. He says, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. This word right is actually the word dikaios. It's righteousness. 
They say wh- whether it is right, but that kind of loses it in the English. In the Greek, it says, whether it is a righteous thing in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. So what is, what is righteousness? That's what it all comes down to. What is the righteousness of God? That's how we make our decisions. Remember what he said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what we seek. We seek his righteousness. And above all, who is the righteous one? Jesus Christ. So we seek him, the righteous one, and everything he stands for and everything his name stands for, and that is the righteousness of God. And how do we know that righteousness? from his word. We read his word, we read his truth, and that's how we know his righteousness. Go over to um, 1 John, because remember whenever we studied the book of 1 John, we saw that John made a bold statement, and he told us that true Christians practice righteousness. And it's a very bold statement that he says. Now remember, the apostle John is right here with Peter proclaiming this truth. And he says, whether it is right in the sight of man, whether it's a righteous thing to do this, you judge. So they're, they're basing their decisions on righteousness. Look at um, verse 29 of chapter two. So this is what John says. He says, if you know that he is righteous, that's Jesus Christ, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And you remember that word practice is the word poyeo. So everyone who commits himself to righteousness is born of him. These are Christians who have chosen righteousness. Now, this doesn't mean that you never sin, because thank God if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one who forgives us our sin. But this is, what are you committed to? Have you committed your life to righteousness? Have you committed your life to the things that are right in the eyes of God and his word? That's how we live. And then look at in verse 10 of chapter three, he goes on and he says, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. This is how you know a child of God versus a child of the devil. It's made manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness, whoever does not commit their lives to righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So John, the apostle John is telling us, we must commit our lives to righteousness. This is what true Christians do. And so when the government decrees something that goes against righteous, the righteousness of God, we have to decide, are we going to choose God or are we going to choose righteousness or are we going to choose unrighteousness? Something that's an abomination that they, that, that man has come up. And so this is what we as Christians need to be doing. And it's more relevant than, than ever in America right now today. So in Acts chapter four, we see governing authorities acting contrary with God's righteousness and they have, a, they have a decision. How do we respond to these things when they happen? When the governing authorities are contrary to God's righteousness. Now, government is a good thing. Government is ordained by God. This is Romans 13. Romans 13 says that we must submit to the government. We need to pay taxes. We need to obey their laws. We, and the reason why the purpose of government is there is so that it it. If it's done right, if government is done right, what it does is it limits anarchy, it lim- limits barbarism, it limits chaos, and it keeps evil at bay. So that's the institution ordained by God. It's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an institution established to, um, to create order and structure in civil matters. And that's the key that we have to understand. There's a sphere of civil matters that the government is only in control of. The government has no business re- uh, being in, in the business of the church. There's a sphere of, of civil matters. There's a sphere of family. There's a sphere of, of the church that God has, has ordained for us to gather together. Those are the spheres that God has ordained. So government is right when it stays in its own sphere. As soon as it starts trying to be the head of the church, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. There's nobody else that can take that place. So again, government is right when it's in its sphere and it's actually doing and it's it's proposing laws that go in accordance with God's righteousness. So there are limits on the government's control because the government should only be involved with the authority over civil matters. That's, that's all the government has in control is over civil matters. They don't have authority over the church. 
And as soon as they cross those boundaries, then, and they start dictating matters that are contrary to God's righteousness and trying to take the place of Jesus Christ, then that's wrong and it's out of place. And so when the government establishes laws that are in accordance with God's righteousness, then that's a good thing because we can obey God and man at the same time. But as soon as the government decrees something contrary to God and his righteousness, then we have a choice. Do we obey God or do we obey man? And I don't want to get into a political thing because I, don't want, to, I want the focus to be on Jesus Christ. But we know that there are laws being established right now by our government that are in direct violation of God's righteousness. And we have to stand for truth and not waver against that, even unto persecution. And we all know what this is. And, and so like I said, the, these, these self-righteous people who think they are so morally excellent are establishing laws and they laugh at us when, they, when we go against them because they think they are righteous. Yes, that is happening. We have those here today. And so they are dictating laws that go against the righteousness of God. And so if you so then go over to 1 Peter, you're in 1 John, just go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, think about this. This is Peter. This is the apostle Peter. He was standing at the Sanhedrin and he was saying, it is, it, it, is it a right thing to obey God or man? You judge, saying that uh, we're going to obey God rather than man, right? And he says that in chapter five as well. But the same apostle wrote these words in chapter two, verse 13. So listen to this. Do we think that there's a contradiction? Let's read these words. First Peter chapter two, verse 13. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him. So the apostle Peter, he's telling us we need to submit to the government. It's for the Lord's sake. But notice the the words that follow here in verse 14, because this is to the point that we submit to the government. He says, we submit to the government and to the governors and to those who are sent by him for or for the purpose of punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So as long as the government is punishing evil and praising good, that's a righteous thing. Right? They, they, whenever they're decreeing laws that are punishing evil and praising good, that's righteousness, right? That's a righteous thing to do. That's what we, that's good for the government to do. It keeps evil at bay. The problem is, and what we're starting to see in the world and in America today, is they're flipping it and they are punishing good and praising evil. And so Peter says, submit to the government for the purpose of punishing evil and praising good, but what if the government and these laws are doing the opposite? What if they're punishing good and praising evil? That's what we're seeing right now. Now, not all the laws are doing this, of course, but there are definitely certain laws and there's a certain agenda coming against the name and that we cannot abide by, we can't stand by, right? So we have to choose to obey God rather than man when these laws are punishing good and they are praising evil. In fact, this happened all the way back in Isaiah. Go back to Isaiah chapter five. And this was happening all the way back. Now this is actually in accordance with judgment on Israel um, back in, in Isaiah chapter five, but it's so relative to what's happening today. In Isaiah chapter five, verse 20, he says this, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those. That's what, that's what we see. These laws that go against God's righteousness are calling evil good and good evil. And they're putting darkness for light and light for darkness. And they put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. These people, they've, they've abandoned God's righteousness and they are going after something that's their own righteousness, something that is just with greed and pride. Now the same thing is, is said in Proverbs 17. Solomon says the same thing in Proverbs 17.5. He says he, or 17.15, uh, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just. So think about those words. The one who is justifying the wicked and the one who condemns the just. That's the same thing as saying, you know, praising the wicked and 
and, uh, um, and condemning the good, right? And pra praising the wicked and punishing the good. That's the same thing. So then he says, both of them, the one who's doing that, are alike an abomination to the Lord. So the one, so, so you think about this. We are called to follow God's righteousness, to seek his righteousness. How can we seek something that's an abomination to the Lord how can we do that? That's what Peter and John are saying. We cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. We can't follow along with abomination. To, to, speak, to speak against the name is to be an abomination. To speak against all these things, and I don't want to even name them because it'll get us off onto something we don't want to talk about. <laughs> but, but whenever we think about those things, those are an abomination to the name. They're an abomination to the righteousness of God. So when the government and ruling authorities contradict the righteousness of God, are related to his word, then we must always obey God and his righteousness rather than man and their abominations. Yeah. The good news, Zach, is that this is going to purify the church. Yes, that's right. I believe that with all my heart. Yes, this is because right now there are Christians that are so confused because they think that these these laws coming from the government, because they say they're righteous and they say they're good things and they say they're loving things. There are Christians that are confused thinking that those are the righteousness of God and they're, they're only confused because they don't read their Bible. <laughs> they're, they're, that's why they're confused. But if what's gonna happen, they will not stand. When the time comes to make the stance for truth, are they gonna reject or are they gonna harden? They, though, that's Matthew 13. Those that, that aren't rooted in the truth, those are, that are not rooted in good soil, when persecution and tribulation arises for the word's sake, sake, they stumble, right? They fall away. That's, that's that persecution, that's that purification you're saying. And I believe that with all my heart. So, a pure church, yes, that's right, yes. So now going back to verse 20 now, talking about, Peter and John standing in the Sanhedrin council. Look at this bold stance of truth and righteousness that they're going to obey God rather than man. It says, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And the Greek uses two double negatives. Now in English, we don't use double negatives because it cancels each other out. But in the Greek, when there's a double negative, it actually adds emphasis. And so in the Greek, it, and it actually wor works pretty good in the English too, but it says, it is not possible for us to not speak about that which we have seen and heard. It's not possible that we don't speak about Jesus and his name and the things that we have heard. And so you think about what are the things that they have heard? This is Peter and John. What are the things that they have seen and heard? Go back over to 1 John. 1 John tells us exactly what he has seen and heard. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the words of life. You know what they saw and they heard? <laughs> they saw word, the word of life manifested in the flesh and that life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and we declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. They saw and heard eternal life manifested in front of them. How can you not but speak than that and what you've heard. You know, they, they just, they, they cannot do it. So that's, so it is impossible for them to stop speaking in the name. So this bold stance for Jesus, it reminds me of the blessed Polycarp. I, I think some of you have heard me tell the story of, of the martyr of martyrdom of Polycarp. Polycarp, he was an amazing man. He was a, they call him the blessed Polycarp. He lived from 69 to 155 AD. He was actually, um, a, 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 he was a disciple, a follower of the apostle John. He, he was in the churches of Asia. He was actually the bishop of Smyrna. And if you remember Smyrna, whenever the apostle John wrote Revelation, how the, uh, the seven letters to the seven churches, the bishop of Smyrna, that was actually the persecuted church. And he was the bishop of the church of, at Smyrna. And remember, there was nothing bad said about the church at Smyrna. And, and in fact, Jesus told him, be faithful until death. 
Those are the words that we hear to the church of Smyrna. And, and Polycarp is the bishop of the church of Smyrna, and he grew up and learned from the apostle John. And so the, uh, this can be found, this martyrdom story can be found in Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, the, church, the history of the church. It's a wonderful story. And I've read some of it in the past and other lessons to you. It really moves me. Uh, but this is exactly what, what it says to stand for truth. Because uh, Polycarp was an old man. He had been a Christian and was well known throughout the Roman Empire as a Christian. Finally, the Romans, they, they got him and they, they arrested him and they brought him into the arena. And they're going to feed him to either the lions or they're going to burn him at the stake. Well, they found out that they couldn't feed him to the lions. There was something that happened that day. So they couldn't feed him to the lions. So they said, we're going to burn him at the stake. So they tie him up to the stake. But before they do that, the Roman official who's in charge of this and, and remember this they're in an arena and there's thousands of people around them and they know the, the blessed polycarp and this roman official looks down at him and he says you're an old man i don't want to do this to you all you have to do is reject jesus christ and and recant and pledge allegiance to caesar and we're going to let you go and these are the these are the words that polycarp says in response to that he says, for 80 and six years have I been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Amen. Man, aren't those beautiful words? Here he's going to be killed, martyred for the name of Jesus, and he says, he's saying the same thing that Peter and John are saying. I, I've, I've followed him my whole life, he, and, and my whole life he's been good to me. That song that we just sang, all my life he's been so good to me. Jesus Christ is so good to us, and, and I've been his servant for 86 years. How can I even think in this last moments to blaspheme the name of my king? You can't, right? And so the, the story goes, it's an amazing story uh, because they, they say, okay, they tie him up to the stake, and they light the pile on fire, and the fire starts coming up, and the people are looking in at the fire and the body is not being consumed. It's, he's not burning. And rather what they do is they see that it's like silver and gold being refined as in fire. As silver and gold is refined in fire, so was Polycarp's body. It wasn't being consumed. And I love that imagery because it's the fire that's going to, the, the fire of persecution, the fire of, of those things are going to purge out, just like Gail was saying. It's going to purge and it's going to, it's going to show our document. It's going to show our proven genuineness. And, and here with Polycarp, he was proven genuine in the fire as silver and gold is tried in the fire. And the fire wasn't consumed. And the, the what is read in, in the book of uh, ecclesiastical history is that blood actually came from the heavens and it actually extinguished the fire and all the whole arena didn't know what was going on. It was a supernatural miracle that just happened. And so then they're, they, they, they don't know what to think. They know this is Jesus Christ. They know this is Jesus doing this. They just don't know how. Same thing as what's happening with the Pharisees. And so then uh, this Roman official just comes up and he stabs him and he dies that way. But what an amazing thing that God did right in that instance that he showed his glory in that instance. And he showed that the blessed Polycarp was proven genuine in that moment because he did not compromise. He, he could have compromised and he could have been let go, but why, how could you do that? God has been so good to us, right? And that's just what we do. We stand on his faithfulness every single day. That's why we don't recant. He gave us eternal life. He's been so good to us. Even though if we're going through hard times and struggles, you know what, count it all joy, my brother, when you go through that things, because it's just your proven genius being, being proven. And we, we know we have everlasting life in him. And so how can we, how can we we do that? How can we go against his name? And so the Jewish leaders then going back to Acts chapter four, the Jewish leaders, they can't refute the wisdom of Peter and John. And so they respond with these further threats. And they say in verse 21 and 22, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle had been performed. So notice this, they, they're trying to convict them, they're trying to punish them, but they're finding no way of punishing them. And notice these words, because of the people. 
And I think that's an interesting thing that Luke brings up here because you remember back at the end of chapter two when it says that they were all coming together and they had favor with all the people. Well, now this favor with all the people, the thousands of people that are seeing the glory of God, they're actually providing some type of supernatural protection for these apostles, for these thousands of Christians. And so it's because of that fear that the, that the mob of the people might attack them if they go against the apostles that they actually don't punish them. And so if you look look over in Acts chapter 5 verse 26 we actually see how scared they were of this in Acts chapter 5 verse 26 this is again another instance of them being arrested and it says when the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence for they feared the people lest they should be stoned so notice that the captain of the temple they they were scared to do anything with uh, to the apostles because they were scared of being stoned. So there's this there's this supernatural protection even coming on because the people glorified God. Now this says that the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So the the evidence of this miracle couldn't be denied. And if you remember this is I said this a few weeks ago, this is why I believe God chose to heal this man right at this particular time because it gave the most glory to God in this particular time because he had been laid at the temple gate for years and we we know that Jesus went into the temple passed by this guy assuming presumably he passed by this man and Jesus didn't heal this man then but Jesus healed this man now and it gave him the most glory, right? Just a, a, it's neat seeing this providential hand of God at work with, with healing here. And so then Peter and John, they're released from prison. And, and so verse 23, this is what they do. As soon as they are released from prison, it says, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. I think this is so neat because look at what they do. They don't go running off to their own house. They don't go into seclusion. They go back to the brethren. They go back to their own, their own companions. They go back to the fellowship. This is why it's so important that as we endure persecution and as persecution ramps up in America, especially we come together in fellowship. Whenever we get released from prison by some supernatural miracle or an angel lets us out of prison or who, whatever he's going to do, or if we're in prison and we're being tortured, we know that in the cell, I got my brother Randy there that I'm going to go back and I'm going to praise God with him just like Paul and Silas. That type of thing. We, we have fellowship with one another and we go and we, we go back to the fellowship. We go back to fellowship with God first and out from that fellowship with one another. And that's exactly what they do. They don't go and run and hide. They come back into fellowship. And so... They stand strong together. And so this is where we'll, we'll end it here because I don't want to rush this last Psalm 2. But look at what they say in, in verse 24. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. So notice what they're doing. They go back with their brethren and they come together and they start praising God. And notice what they do. They call God Lord. This word, we're going to get into this next week. This word Lord is not the normal word for Lord. It's not kurios. It's despotes. It's a despot. It's, it's the one who holds absolute power. Now, a, a, a man, a, a human flawed man who is a despot is usually a tyrannical leader and someone that you don't like. But God is the only man who can be called the true despot, the one who holds all power. Jesus Christ is the man who holds all power. He's the creator of the universe. He's the great I am. And that's who they're crying out to. They're crying out to the Lord God, the despot, the creator creator of all power, the creator of all the universe, and he holds all absolute power. And so this is now what they're doing. They're coming back into one accord, and I'll just skip to the very end here, because this is what they cry out. They're crying out Psalm chapter 2, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and why did the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So they they quote Psalm chapter two and they quote Psalm chapter two because in that Psalm, it's telling us that God has a plan. 
that everything that is happening to this point is interwoven because of God's plan of redemption for all of us. And they're focusing on that. They're not complaining about being arrested. They're not complaining about being tortured. They're praising God for being the despot, the one who has all in control, who is our sovereign God, who has the plan of redemption all laid out according to his infinite foreknowledge, and he's weaving all this into our eternal life with him. And so that's how we're gonna end it, that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and, and he is in control of all these things, and we don't need to be scared of any of these things that happen because he has this all planned out. He knew that this was gonna happen to Peter and John, and he knows that that stuff's gonna happen to us. Now, he doesn't cause this, you know me. I don't believe he's doing these things to, to hurt us. He's calling us into, be, into the, the mission field to be ambassadors for him, and we know that there, there are bad people out there, but he calls us into the mission field to proclaim the name and we might suffer and we will suffer persecution for the name but just be of good cheer because he's overcome the world and because he has this all planned out for before the foundation of the world so as your as your homework i want you to read psalm chapter 2 verses 1 through 12 the the, psalm, the whole psalm is 12 verses i want you to read psalm chapter 2 this is what we're going to focus on next week we're going to look at psalm chapter 2 and we're going to compare that to the prayer that they pray and we're going to see how they trusted in god for everything and that jesus christ is king of kings and lord of lords and i want you to see the comparison between psalm chapter 2 why are they quoting this psalm and how it relates to god's plan of redemption Right? Praise God. All right. Let's go ahead and wrap up with prayer then. Father, we thank you so much that you are the one with absolute control. You are the one who has laid this out from the beginning. You have planned out our redemption from before the foundation of the world. And you gave us your son, Jesus Christ, to give us eternal life, that we might have eternal fellowship with you, Father, and eternal fellowship with one another here. Father, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters here. I thank you that in you we can have fellowship with one another and that we have the boldness to proclaim the name that is above every name and that we can stand strong even in the midst of persecution, even, in the, even unto death because you are in control. And the other side of life, uh, the other side of this life is death. The other, <laughs> sorry, the other side of this life is eternal life. And this death is just a pathway to eternal glory. And that's what we praise you. We honor you. You are the one in control and we just humble ourselves to you. So give us the strength to go about and proclaim your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.